Um, here's the situation that Klaus is in right now. Over the past 45 years, his IT stack has been managed by a privatized monopoly. This was just dissolved, just quite recently. He can't, hire, can't, he can't afford to hire new designers. He works in the public sector in Denmark, where agility sometimes is mistaken for medical diagnoses. He's catering to a highly literate and very demanding group of citizens who are expecting seamless user experiences. He hates the fact that his old IT system dictates so much of the user experience that he's trying to create, and that is keeping him from modernizing his public service offering. How can you possibly deal with that? Okay, Klaus Estagor is an independent consultant and teacher at the IT University in Copenhagen, and here he is here to tell us how. So please give him a warm welcome, Klaus Estagor. As um, already been said, my name is Klaus Östergaard. I'm here to talk about capabilities of the architect. Um, and up front here, I'm a not a rebel. I am conservative, I'm old, I'm grumpy. Uh, every time somebody says disruption or innovation, I say, yeah, hang on a minute, but what about, I'm that guy. Uh, deep down in my soul, when I sit in my little chamber at night, I love innovation and self-management teams and anarchistic approaches, uh, but that's what I want to achieve. But what is the foundation? And the foundation for that, um, just to clarify who I am. I teach at the university, IT University of Copenhagen. Uh, then I am a course leader, that means I design courses and develop courses for the associations of municipalities in Denmark. And then I'm an enterprise architect consultant and something more. During the presentation, I will be showing you some pictures. They have not necessarily anything to do with the presentation. It's just because this was the first presentation where I actually was able to use one of my favorite graphic novel series, uh, Le City Obscure, uh, because we often, when we talk about architecture, uh, do it in a uh, sort of urban planning uh, metaphor. So now I could finally use these uh, beautiful uh, graphic novels, uh, drawings from this series. So, but some of them fits in. Yeah, that's just my excuse for doing that. Let me just set the stage for where I am. As I said, I am a fundamentalist. I want to say, but what about? I'm all about the what aboutism. Um, right now, as already mentioned, I'm working with the public sector in Denmark, in sp particularly the municipalities of Denmark. There's 98 of them. They are in a very special situation in some regards and normal situation in other regards. Uh, if we take a normal situation or like anybody else in Europe right now, there's the GDPR. Can I have a hands up? if we know what that is? Yeah, I thought so. So the whole GDPR, of course, if you're in a public sector, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of services, there's a lot of data floating around. So the whole uh, new way of looking at, for example, who owns the data. According to GDPR, now it's the subject that owns the data, where in the old days it would be the institution that owns the data. All of this and how to secure your data. And of course, we don't know quite what the fines will mean for the public sector, but we know what the fine will mean for the private sector when the smallest fine is 10 million euros. Is that correct? Yeah, doesn't matter. So that, for example, has a huge influence on how we set up our structure uh, in the public sector in Denmark. 
other than that, there's the ever-growing expectation of better service. We have the millennial factor coming in, for example. If I have to interact with my municipality, I don't want to call them. I want to go into a web page and I want to find my information there. And if I want further information, I will probably go into some kind of a chat or something like that. I definitely don't want to go down to an office, take a number and sit for four or five hours. That's not my expectation anymore. I want everything on the tip of my fingers, on my device, at home, in the right format, or on my phone when I'm sitting over there listening to the next speaker. I just wanted to go in and just do some problem solving as a citizen of my country. Of course, the technological advancement also have an influence on how we do things and how we set up services. Um, and uh, internally in the municipality, it would be like all we already described, we used to have a monolith and we have microservices, we had SOA and things like that. <clears throat> Apart from that, the special thing about the municipality of Denmark was there used to be a company called KMD, Municipality Data, if I had to translate it directly to English, Kommune Data in Danish. Um, they were responsible for all the techno technological things regarding the municipalities. That means all the applications, all the IT systems, were, they were responsible for that. Very monolithic, uh, very trust, uh, when you talk about monolithic trust in the Americas. Uh, and then there came a law that says, this is no longer the right way to do it. We want um, a competition in this system. So they said, this company is no longer allowed to be the only company. And all the municipalities looked and said, yeah, but we don't know anything about our application landscape, for example. We don't know anything about our architecture because it's all in that company. So suddenly, the municipality was told, yeah, you have to figure that out. And that's where I came in because there's the support uh, company or what you, you could call it the association of municipalities of Denmark. It's sort of a company, it's a consultancy company, we can't really have public, but they do things to support the development of the municipalities of Denmark. They said, so what are we going to do? And they, somebody said, yeah, we have to take the architecture back, but we cannot hire new people. So what we want to do is we want to educate the people who are already working in the municipalities to take care of this challenge. So they called me because I do courses and things like that. And together with them, I developed a course to say, what is it actually the minimal product a municipality needs to look at or the minimal uh, deliveries in the context of architecture. To do that, I went on a tour. I went around Denmark to talk to the municipalities and figure out what is actually the challenge. What do they know? What don't they know? There was a lot of people. I spoke to 200 plus different employees of municipalities all over Denmark very engaged people. They want to do something, but they had no idea where to begin or what they were dealing with, what this architecture thing was. And of course, somebody said enterprise architecture to them, and that just made it even worse because that's even more meta than everything the other architecture domains is all about. I would get into that later. <coughs> so to set the stage even further, this is I went into a case because I did some 
consulting on a case that is actually exactly what we were talking about in the municipality. It is the social services of the municipality of Copenhagen. Municipality of Copenhagen is the biggest employer in Denmark. Because, you know, Denmark, the welfare state, Fox News' uh, favorite go-to when you want to talk about socialism. I don't know if you've seen the YouTube video going around at the moment. <coughs> so, welfare state, big municipality. One of the services is the social services, which deals with vulnerable people. That means drug addicts, alcoholics, uh, abused uh, children, the, all the little people, the vulnerable people of the society. This little uh, department has 7,000 employees, all uh, engaged in doing good services. Just have to keep an eye on that, yeah. <coughs> they also got their whole architecture back from the KMD and said, okay. And then at the same time they said, okay, now we have a new situation. Could we use that to maybe even become even better at delivering that service where we help these vulnerable people? Uh, they have, of course, the same challenges that the rest of the municipality has. Um, they were fragmented, non-uniform data. In this case, the whole culture was it's very autonomous units. There's 500 plus small units that take care of this. It could be, an example could be a small uh, stead, homestead for maybe three or four vulnerable people, former drug addicts, in a halfway house, uh, trying to get their life in order again. And so they live in a small uh, house together. There's a social worker that almost lives with them. Uh, there's a 24-7 uh, service for them. And the whole thing is connected into the uh, system of social services. So that social worker has an um, access point to all the things that you need to help a vulnerable person, like let's say it's a former drug addict, and they're trying to do something for them. But we got into this problem that, yeah, we want to do something for them, so we want to make the best offering for them. What should they do? How should they apply for a job? Uh, how should they get on in life? That's easy. If you want to do that, we need to collect all the information about this individual, right? Yeah, right, but not so easy. Because if you are a former drug addict, okay, so there's information about your habits, your drug habits. You probably also have kids. And how do you interact with these kids? That's another system. Can you mix those systems? If you're a social worker in this house, are you allowed to see the information about the kids? And they probably has been placed in foster care and something like that. Are you allowed to have this information? Long discussion about that. Then, of course, there's the ex-wife or the ex-husband and something about um, maternity, you know, what do you call it when you pay money to kids? I can't remember. Alimony, things like that. So there was a whole bunch of things. All these people wanted to make the best possible offering for these people, giving them the service uh, that they needed so they could, well, I, I wrote strategy, but it's more like a success uh, criterion that more citizens with special needs has an experience of being involved in their own case. Instead of this, like it was in the old days, you're not qualified, we'll take care of your case. You come in here, we tell you what to do. In this case, try to involve people in their own life and try to help them get out of this vicious circle that they're probably in by involving them. 
And that's what they wanted to do, but it was so hard because of the DGBR. It was, we had fragmented systems, non-uniform data, because if you have 500 plus autonomous units, how many terms have you def uh, defined for the same thing? Yeah, that would be 500 plus different terms. And trying to collect all that data, send it through the same system, make it available for the social worker to help this vulnerable person. That was just an enormous task. Uh, when you have 500 plus units to do it in. So this is, was a typical example of how the problem was with all these social services that the municipality has to do. And this was not special for Copenhagen municipality. This was the 97 others had the same exact problem. On top of that, they didn't have any specialized structure people. They didn't have any architects. They maybe had somebody who was really good at application, but again, the application was mostly handled by the KMD. <coughs> On top of that, they didn't have the money to hire a plethora of architects. They couldn't hire these when some of the big companies in, in Denmark, Maersk or Lego goes in and said, we're just gonna hire 50 architects and bring them in and do process uh, modeling on the whole thing. No, they had to do it themselves. <clears throat> and in their case, when I came out to the first meetings with these architects, it sort of seems like people had just been handed seven different hats. One said enterprise architect, one said information architect, one said application architect, change management architect, all kinds of different architects and responsibilities. And they usually had some inkling of one of the domains, but all of the domains and how they were interconnected, that was the challenge. So we tried to figure out, me designing these courses that should help them in, um, in collaboration with the Association of Municipalities. What is it actually they need? What is the least viable delivery they need? Because I only had four days of courses. And of course, as everybody would say here, business architects, that's a lifetime. Enterprise architects, if it is something different than business architects, I won't get into that discussion here. We can take that in the break. That's a lifetime. Information architect, or as I like to call it, the knowledge management, that's another lifetime. And then of course, application architecture, another lifetime. And I had four days, that means one for each. How do I get it down and get the whole thing rolling. I have on purpose called it the three plus one pillar of architecture because there's something when I said four pillars and I mentioned all these architectural domains, people say, yeah, enterprise architecture is not a pillar. It's more like a foundation. It's more like a, a roof or something like that. And I got bogged down in my own metaphor and I hate that. But you know how it is. I have this nice picture. There's four pillars in, in each of these. And yes, it has to be four pillars. It's the same. I started out with the deliveries of each of these architectural domains that I would get into. And I said, there has to be four deliveries on each. And that was my OCD going completely hay way haywire. Uh, and I said, yeah, but nobody asked me to make only four deliveries. I could do three or five. That would be OK. That's a completely other story about my mental unhealth. Again, another nice picture from my graphic novels. Again. So the first thing I said, business architecture. What are the primary deliveries we need here? If you are a newly appointed architect in the municipality of XX in Denmark, 
what you have done until now is that you have been the guy in charge of a server down in the basement with a soldering iron in your hand and, uh, and doing something with that. And suddenly somebody says, yeah, what you need to do is interact more with the rest of the organization. <laughs> this guy is scared shitless, right? So I try to, s to break it to him gently that he needs to talk to other people very gently. And the first thing I would say, you need to consider something called business architecture. And he of course been, no, no, I don't want to. Yeah, but you have to. If you want to do something good for the citizen of your municipality, that usually get them going because that's what they want to do. People are not working in the public sector to make money. They make, they're working there to make a difference. So it was very easy with this, uh, Sasha talked about engaged people. Yeah, that was not that hard. Uh, everybody was engaged and I have never seen when we, when I have designed the courses and, um, and the association went out with in the newsletter and said we have this course, I have never seen courses fill that fast because it was of course on a, uh, 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 what do you call it, <laughs> free really. Volunteer basis. I'm looking at the Danish in the audience. Um, volunteer basis. But, and I said, okay, let's do 25 seats on each course because we're never going to fill uh, 25 seats each time. <clears throat> 25 registered and a waiting list. I've never seen anything like it. Three weeks, completely filled. So, of course, okay, there's a hunger. So, I went in and said, Okay, if you come down from the engine room, you're very good at service, you should consider something like business architecture. Business architecture is not that hard. Oh, right? Good. Capabilities, I said, that's the first delivery. What is it actually we do? Are we agreed on it? It wasn't that hard in this situation because what we do is, we provide service for the citizen. We make sure that the citizen gets what they need from interacting with us. And we look at what is our capabilities in the future. If any of you have any heard about architecture before, you will of course know that it's all about the as is and the to be situation and how do we get there. So it's the future organization. So that's, that wasn't that hard. Then we said, we need to model it. And of course, if you already had a horde of business process renewal group in or Alex in, and then all your process is already modeled and optimized and all these things. But if you hadn't, which most of them didn't, you have to figure out what are our processes and how can we at the same time document them? Which language do we use? Uh, do we use the same language, all of us? Yeah, that would be nice, instead of using different languages. Uh, for example, they went out and said, Archimate is the way to go in this case. And of course, if you have a uh, process that you have already documented, how about looking into optimizing it? There's no process more than five minutes old that couldn't use a good optimization, right? Uh, so you could do that at the same time. There's 500 plus units in the municipality of Copenhagen just in the social department with different processes for each interaction. Also, if you want to do something good for the, uh, for the vulnerable citizen, the same process in same places or different places, that would be nice. That makes them calm down and say, I recognize this. If the whole thing is up in the air, I know we talked about anarchy about two hours ago and I was just thinking, how does that fit into this? Well, let's do it after. After we have the whole thing locked down and this is the structure. Um, and then 
this person had to ensure there was a connectivity between the application architecture, which I will come to, and the information architecture. And we have these processes mapped to applications. That was the minimal delivery of this domain, not to freak them out. I remember Sasha had that last, one of the last slides with a million different boxes on it. That was not where we were. That is a million years in the future. But at, of course, at some point you can go there, but this was just, this is the minimal. For information architecture, it was primary knowledge management we focused on. How do we collect data? How do we create data? How do we um, interact with this pesky thing called tacit knowledge? All these things that is in the domain of uh, knowledge management. But on top of that, because this is architecture, not just knowledge management, it was also about getting business people and technology people into the same room and and stop them from tearing each other's head off. In this case, business people were very much the frontline people, the, the social worker, the people who are interacting, the people who knew the processes, the people who were in the process, and the technology people who just wanted the new master database or something like that. Get them to talk the same language. That would also be this is all, all the time I'm talking about this, is the, the responsibility of the architect. And just to give it a completely spin on it or make it completely crazy, this is one person we're talking about the whole way. It's just one person. And then when you have gotten the business people and the technology people to agree on terms and what things are called, uh, this is called a vulnerable citizen, or it's a citizen, or it's something else. This is a drug addict, this is an alcoholic, is there a difference? And all these kinds of things, and the logical list and all these things that you have to do, you have to display them. So you have to capture all this information uh, and display them to the people so they, when you're sitting as a social worker in one of these autonomous units, you can go in and figure out, has somebody already done the work for me when I'm talking about this term? And of course, maintaining it. And then the architectural part of it, for example, would be ensure that people are in coherence with the rules and standards. That's always fun, isn't it? Uh, and that's what they didn't want to do, but I, I understand that because um, the whole information architecture is definitely the biggest challenge. Every time I talk to somebody involved in this area, it's just, and then I went down to this department and they didn't want, and uh, because they had already, and they thought that their way was the best way and they were definitely mad at the other department who were doing sort of the same thing, but calling everything something different. And now we can't figure out what to call it. Super. Yeah, that's your job. Um, but it has to be done. Application architecture, the responsibilities here, that was uh, actually the easiest part because that's very much technique. Technique is not a problem. When we talk about um, adaptive uh, complex systems, like we're talking about here and everybody is nodding because adaptive complex system is just number two thing you think about in the morning after coffee. <laughs> the easy part of that will be the technology now. The difficult part is what all the others are talking about, so I won't, the people. How do people interact? So when we talked about application architecture, most of them were down with it, that they needed to figure out what, how many applications do we have. Of course we went into the discussion, what is an ap application? Does anybody know what an application is? Yeah, everybody knows what it is. We just have one to 60 different opinions about it. But we know we need an overview of the applications, both 
to figure out what do we have that we don't need, how many of them, how many licenses are we paying that we don't need to have anymore, and also how do we map in the uh, business architecture, we talked about mapping the process to application. Yeah, we need to figure out what applications we need to map into. Then we need to set up, I told them, to set up a strategy for the application. What is the future? Are we going cloud? Are we going microservices? Are we going back to monolith? We're going to do the whole legacy system, get a bunch of COBOL programmers in and do the whole thing over again because those uh, IBM server <laughs> mainframe, they were actually quite good. Probably wouldn't, but you could. So what is the strategy for our applications? And of course, uh, ensuring the connectivity to the business architecture. That's not just, oh, yeah, ensuring the connectivity, now we have mapped it. No, it's also the human part, the hippie part, the soft part, where we get these people to think along the same line. What is the vision of a company? Why are we doing this thing? That was very much a part of this when we talk architecture, is why are we doing this thing? We don't do architecture for architecture's uh, sake. We do it because there's a vision. In this case, there was a clear vision. We want to do, and here comes the first time I said, customer journey. The good customer journey, right? We want that uh, social worker sitting out on Amar, I know you've all been to Copenhagen, I know Amar, the island, uh, and you love it. Uh, the IT university is there. Um, and sitting there, and this person wants to help. And when she looks at her screen, or he looks at his screen, she can't get the information because it's all fragmented, and there's a GTPR that makes sure that we can't do all the, the lawyers say we can't do that. How can we make sure that this person feels feel that they have the information to help this person sitting across? We were even talking about in the social department of uh, the municipality of Copenhagen about could we make one of these where you simply turn the screen and look at the screen with the citizen themselves. I know it's crazy. And, and look at the same information I know we shouldn't have people looking into their own cases. They might not like what they see and they're not qualified to look at it. But that's what we actually wanted to do. <coughs> Sorry, I need something to drink. So, so the whole thing was how do we make a foundation to make sure we can actually deliver that service? Last thing about um, did you give me ten minutes? I, did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I ran into my own world there. Sorry about that. I, well, uh, so the last thing was, do we choose the right solutions? Last thing was enterprise architecture, and of course, I already mentioned the feud that's going on on LinkedIn. What is, is the, the same as business architecture, and John Tuckman says, and Roger Bolton says, and everybody's into that. And if you're not in the architecture world, stay out of it. You don't want that kind of hassle. No. So, uh, in this case, I just use it as sort of a governance uh, attempt where we say, Archit enterprise architecture in this case was making sure that the overall uh, frames for this architecture thinking is in place, sort of an umbrella, the glue between the different other domains. And maybe that's where we look outside of the architecture thinking, for example, into what is the strategy. In this case, it was very nice because the strategy was very simple give good service and don't get any more customers because they will come automatically. That was a nice part. It was not like we use a, when we talk about the customer journey, it was a, how can we sell more Teslas? It's just, I don't know how to sell more Teslas. Somebody else deal with that. I deal with people. And then in short, there was this coherency across the different domains of architecture. 
and, and be the boss. Make sure they all deliver on what they should deliver. Still, only one person. And there's an overlap to the different domains. You can even, I even saw a term called an enterprise information architect. So there's also something with governance in the different domains. But the whole, in summary, the whole thing was making that boring structure that gives us the capability of doing the innovative customer journey. That was what it was all about. And that was what we all bought into in four days. Yeah, that was it. <laughs>